ventilation means breathing and there's two parts inhalation and exhalation okay and so i said that uh breathing really involves breathing really involves um the principle of diffusion except we replace the word diffusion with pressure because we're talking about air pressure so if you go to slide number 38 it says here pressure see it says uh, air moves from an area of high pressure to an area of lower pressure that's all we just that's why this is called physiology we just follow the law of physics that's the same for air where it's where the pressure is higher it just follows its concentration gradient and so then that's the question how are we able to uh, change the pressure? Oh, I'm going to get my uh, this one. So, there are two pressures involved. The pressure outside, the atmospheric pressure, it's called atmospheric pressure and the lung pressure, the pressure inside your lungs. So atmosphere and the lung pressure, or here it's called alveolar pressure. So the pressure outside is 760. That's the normal atmospheric pressure. So we start with equal pressure. If the pressure outside and the pressure inside 760, if it's the same, do you agree? There will be no movement, right? There will be no movement of air. So the key is to create a lower pressure here. Then air just naturally moves. Here, in this case, we create a lower pressure using what you call Boyle's law. Boyle's law. By the way, do you need to review the anatomy? We discussed that last week from the nose, the hyaline cartilage. So don't forget those uh, the different structures that you wrote down because I remember in the past, the first part of the respiratory system test had a picture of the respiratory tract. I remember that. It was, there was a picture like this. That was the first part like this, where you will be asked to identify, and then maybe you will be asked to uh, uh, describe the important features. Maybe I'll, I remember there was a question, example of the question, identify, you're going to write trachea. So, and then you will be asked, uh, this, this structure is always open normally, true or false. So you're going to write true right because of the hyaline cartilage the cartilage there keeps it open prevents it from collapsing and so and i remember that for that specific test for the respiratory system uh, some of the knowledge on the immune system was also included like uh, what is the lining epithelium you're going to write so the stratified ciliated columnar epithelium this is an example of what type of immunity First or defense, second, first, second, or third line of defense. So you're going to write first line, right? First line is always the intact lining. And then second line are your non specific cells, just the typical white blood cells and proteins. Just think third line are your B cells and your T cells. First is the cover, third is the BMT, and e in between. They're all second line of defense. So remember this. That that's how it was asked in the test. And then a famous question that never was missed out in the test, in every test in the respiratory system, is the carina. It was always asked. Identify, you're going to write the carina. What is the significance of this one? It triggers the most, the strongest complex. It is the most sensitive portion. Okay? So
So don't forget that. Now we're going to go back to our picture. So we follow Boyle's law. There are two parameters or there are two values involved in breathing. It is volume and pressure. And by this one, you see, it's showing me or it's telling me according to Boyle's law, there is an inverse relationship between volume and pressure. Okay? So, when you, let you start with that, let's say us right here, right? So there's how many of us here? On what, however, three, five, ten, eleven. There's eleven of us here. So we're too crowded here. If I tore down this wall and you increase the volume, then there's going to be more space for us to move about, right? So here, pressure is squeezed, but when you tear down this volume, you increase the space, meaning you increase the volume that we occupy, the pressure goes down. Do you understand? According to Boyle's law, there is an inverse relationship between volume and pressure. We go back to the how, how we breathe. We breathe or we inhale or exhale because air moves from an area of high pressure to low pressure. Then I look at this Boyle's law. How can I change the pressure? If we start with equal pressure, how can I change the pressure here? How can I make the pressure here lower? I can do that by increasing the volume. Very good. If I increase the volume, all of a sudden the air molecules here, there's a lot of, the pressure will go down. How do you increase the volume? Muscle contraction. Okay? There are two muscles, in the two general muscles of inhalation. It's your diaphragm and your intercostal muscles. The diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. Look at the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is dome shaped. When you breathe, this diaphragm muscle, it contracts. So from being dome shaped, it will contract or contract. It will flatten, it will contract and flatten. And when it flattens, it's increasing the space, the lung space that way. So you're expanding the lungs. The pressure inside goes down. Do you agree? Okay. There's one more muscle that contracts. It's your intercostal muscles. Why, by the way, why is it that when the diaphragm flattens, the lungs expand? Remember the pleura, how it fuses with the diaphragm? So when this one, the pleura here will pull the lungs down, okay? And then there's something that will expand your lungs that way. It's your intercostal muscles, specifically the external intercostal muscles, okay? When your external intercostal muscles contract, they use the example of the pail, the handle, see, look at, can you picture here, imagine your ribs, when this intercostal muscles contract, they're going to pull the ribs closer to each other. When they pull the ribs closer to each other, like the handle of the pail, or you have any, like this one right here, you see, if we, so this is your ribs, and when you have the intercostal muscles pulling this, you increase the space. See, initially, no space, well, small space. But when you pull this up, because of the contraction of your intercostal, look at the space you increase. You understand? And that's what happens, see? So you contract the diaphragm, flatten the diaphragm, you expand the space that way, contract this intercostal muscles, you expand the space that way. So contraction of these two muscles, the intercostal muscles, 
and the diaphragm will de no will increase the volume in your lungs. How did that happen with this one? Remember, this is where surface tension. Remember, we want high surface tension right here. So my intercostal muscles contracted. Remember the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. So if the lungs, now I'm going to go back to this picture over here. Remember this one, how the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura are stuck together because of surface tension, the fluid. So when you, when these ribs contract, it's go, because they're stuck to the substance of the lungs, it will expand the lungs like an accordion. So when you expand, there's increased volume. Now there's low pressure here. Air just naturally comes in. See? That's why, that's how you breathe in called inhalation. What told those two muscles to contract? That's the question. The what? That's very good. Very good. Very good. Don't forget, okay? Very good. So, it, muscle contraction is an active process. Inhalation is active, meaning muscles needed to contract so you can inhale. This is really what's going on. Do you remember your brain stem? Remember when we were talking about the functions of the medulla and the pons back in Bio 241? The medulla regulates heart and lungs, and then the pons helps the medulla with the lungs. So I'm going to go down right here to this picture over here. Right here. Look at. There's blood going to your brain stem. The medulla. The medulla is the main one. Okay? When the blood that's going to med the medulla is high in carbon dioxide, it triggers a response by telling your phrenic, uh, your your lungs through the phrenic nerve, your lungs, the diaphragm via the phrenic nerve, and then the intercostal nerves to your intercostal muscles, it tells them to contract. So your brain is the one that tells these two muscles to contract. The brain does it because it's receiving blood that's high in carbon dioxide. Don't forget. Respiratory system regulates carbon dioxide concentration. Your RBC is the one that regulates oxygen. So you breathe not because of oxygen, but because of carbon dioxide. This is why I hope it makes sense now. If you go to the pool, there's a sign there, right? Hyperventilation is not advised or you're not allowed or what, what's that? Anyway, you're not supposed to hyperventilate before you jump in the water. Because carbon dioxide is what tells us to breathe. If you decrease the carbon dioxide, will this fire? No. And besides, carbon dioxide is a known vasodilator. So if there's if you hyperventilated and you released a lot of carbon dioxide, what is that doing to my blood vessels, to my brain? It's constricting. It's not vasodilating because there's not enough carbon dioxide. So can you imagine combination, constriction of blood vessels plus no stimulus for this to contract? You can die underwater. You can pass out and then die. That's why they don't encourage hyperventilation. Or when you hyperventilate, don't they say do that in a uh, paper bag? Because you need that carbon dioxide. You need the carbon dioxide to keep your blood vessels open. Okay? You understand? One more time. The blood that's going to my medulla. The medulla. The medulla is the one that sets the rate. How many times you breathe, let's say 20 breaths a minute, it's the medulla that regulates that. The pons, the pons helps the medulla by telling you how long you inhale. 
So I, the pawn says what you call the pneumotaxic center. So the medulla tells you breathe 20 times. The pawn tells you how long is each breathing. So the pawn tells you to stop each time. Then the next one stop, next one stop, next one stop. You understand? Okay, so again, look at this one, right? This is why if we have a break or if you injure your neck, you will stop breathing. What, where was your problem? Was it in the lungs? No, your problem was in the brain, but there's a break. See, inhalation is active. It relies on a healthy nervous system. One more time, carbon dioxide high, going here. If the carbon dioxide is high, by the way, there is a tendency, that's why we don't want very high carbon dioxide because there will be a tendency to develop acidic, to go into acidosis. Carbon dioxide combines with water to form carbonic acid, and that's not good. Uh, exposing yourselves to acid can lead to detrimental conditions like your nerves can cause uh, mental fogginess affect your and then your muscles okay so again high carbon dioxide going to the brain the medulla this responds by telling your diaphragm to this nerve phrenic nerve and the intercostal nerves to the intercostal muscles both of them will contract so when the diaphragm contracts you increase the space that way and when this intercostal muscles contract you increase the space that way the result the pressure goes down. Air just naturally moves in. Now, as you expanded this one because of the uh, contraction of your intercostal muscles and your diaphragm, you remember there's something very important. The, how the lungs are stuck to the thoracic wall, okay? And now I want you to look at, so when you expand your lungs, this one right here, when it expands, this individual alveolar sacs will also expand. Make sense, right? When you pull this, because the lungs is just made up of all of these individual alveolar sacs, they're the ones that's really going to be expanded. Do you follow? Because of the surface tension right here. Remember? Here, in, inside your alveolus, is the surface tension high or low? Low, right? Here, it's high. So one more time, when this one, when the intercostal muscles right here, when it contracts, it's going to pull your lungs and it's going to open up all these alveolar sacs. When they open up, the air goes in. Now, you're going to write down in your notes, exhalation is a passive process. It's passive. What that means is there is no muscle or no nerve, sorry, no nerves required for exhalation to happen. Remember, you have nerves for inhalation, the phrenic nerve and the intercostal nerves. To exhale there's no nerve required this is where your elastic recoil is very important that's why emphysema patients have problems with exhalation they have no problem inhaling now look at the problem with emphysema patients with em it's the elastic fibers remember the see this elastic fibers right here the elastic fibers also surrounding the alveolus, even every alveolus, in addition to the elastic fibers right here in your uh, thoracic wall, every alveolar sac is lined. The wall has elastic fibers. So when the alveolus expands, the elastic fibers get stretched. And when they get stretched, what's the response of elastic fibers when they stretch? They have to recoil. So when they recoil, can you picture in your head? You just inhale all of that air. And then the elastic fibers recoil. 
what will that recoil do? Isn't it going to squeeze all of the air that you just breathe in, right? So what will happen to the pressure here? You're going to increase the pressure here. There's one more factor that needs to increase in the pressure in your alveolus. It's your abdominal pelvic organs. Look at when you inhale, when you inhale, okay, all of the organs right here, so the diaphragm, dome shape, and then it flattens. This is your abdominal pelvic cavity. You have so many organs in your abdominal pelvic cavity. You, what organs do you have here? Kidney, stomach, what else? Everything, small intestines, large intestines, gall. There's all of a sudden they're squeezed together. And so they're, they become so crowded. They want to reclaim their space. So what will happen is they're going to push up because they want to reclaim their space. So imagine the recall of the alveolus and then the GI organs trying to reclaim their space. Isn't that going to uh, crowd all of the air that you just breathed in? So there will be result, there will be increased pressure here it goes up to 762 and then the air pressure right here never changes it's 760 then air will just naturally go out so was there any muscle that contracted during exhalation no exhalation is a passive process inhalation is active okay So it's just like, I like to draw, maybe you can do the same, and then you end up in your cul-de-sac of your lungs. That's really what happens, right? So you're going to write, this is your nose, this is your pharynx, this is the larynx the trachea, the bronchus, ending in the bronchioles. And then this is your alveolus, which is what makes up your lungs. See, the air. So first I needed to, first you start with 760 here, 760 here. This, this is, the pressure is the lungs, okay? In the lungs. This structures right here, they, their job is to provide an always open route for air. So I'm going to say, so because of the contraction of my diaphragm and intercostal muscles, the pressure here went down to 758. You don't need to memorize these pressure numbers, but it went down. So air just naturally goes in. Now I'm going to say, oh, as it's passing through here, it's going to first, here the nose, the air is warmed and humidified. You can filter big substances right there. Then the pharynx will route the air to, through the larynx. Then you have between the, uh, the first part of the larynx, the epiglottis, you say it, it closes, falls backwards and downwards so that the air or food goes to the esophagus but only air comes in. Then beginning here, you have pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium that traps microscopic particles, moves down, moves down. Here in the carina, you're going to write the carina, is the most sensitive part, and it makes sense. See, after that, you're going to get to the, uh, it's just, this is so exposed and simple squamous. Right here, there's already your blood, your capillary, so you see, if you don't, if you don't cut out all of those harmful pathogens, they're going to end up in your blood. So then air just keeps moving, keeps moving. You're going to say here, when you get to the bronchioles, it makes sense. You cannot remain columnar. It cannot remain columnar. 
all the way here because exchange is going to be difficult. So as you get to the bronchioles, it's shedding off a few of its um, wall. You're losing the cartilage. Then the epithelium becomes, it starts to flatten, flatten until here. It's simple squamous epithelium. See, you inhaled all of the oxygen, all of the oxygen. So in the meantime, the blood that's passing through here is high in carbon dioxide. So look at, we follow again the law of diffusion. Oxygen, very concentrated here. It just moves down its concentration gradient. Then carbon dioxide high here moves the opposite direction. So because it's a closed one, it's a cul-de-sac one, so all of the air you breathe in has to go back out. See? But now once what comes out is carbon dioxide. How did it go out? The pressure. You increase the pressure here because of recoil, right? The recoil of your elastic fibers, squeezing out all of the air that you just breathe, and then your GI organs pushing, wanting to reclaim their normal space, the property. So that's how you do out. These structures here, the function of these structures is to provide protection. Is it during inhalation or exhalation? Inhalation. Inhalation, right? Even your nose. The exhalation is just getting rid of carbon dioxide. You understand? Okay? So now we're going to go to this part right here. How are the gases transported? How are the gases transported? So for oxygen, we know that the main, so we understand how it moved, how it ended up in the circulation, right? Oxygen will end up in your blood and carbon dioxide will end up in your alveolus. But how does it, how is oxygen uh, being transported in the body? You know how it's mainly transported. Bound to hemoglobin. Very good. Bound to hemoglobin. See, 98.5% of the oxygen you inhale enters your RBC. It's bound to hemoglobin. And that's how it's transported to your tissue cells. There's still that 1.5% that's present in the plasma as plain oxygen. Then, if it's bound to hemoglobin, do you remember how hemoglobin looks like? Mm -hmm. It is a, yes, very good, the hemoglobin proteins. This is the one that we're familiar with. Okay, so you remember the oxygen is bound to the iron. It's right there in the center. If it's it's like it's locked in a cage. If it's locked in a cage, I wonder how it's going to be released into your body cells. How does it get released? You see the con configuration of the hemoglobin? It's like it's... It's locking it. It's locking the oxygen in there. What is the composition of hemoglobin? Is it a carb, a protein, or a lipid? Protein. It is a protein. So do you agree? Anything that will denature hemoglobin will uh, loosen or release the oxygen, right? It's like you're going to open the cage if you denature that hemoglobin. So... Acid will denature hemoglobin, right? You pour vinegar on your meat, it tenderizes it. So acid will denature the hemoglobin 
loosen its grip on oxygen, unload the oxygen. Lactic acid from muscle activity, right? And isn't that when you need oxygen more? So when there's increased acid conditions in any part of the body, most common is lactic acid, oxygen is right there. Very easy. It will denature the hemoglobin. How about increased temperature, right? If you cook, you need to increase the temperature, then you're denaturing, you're changing your protein. You can eat it like your egg. You increase the heat, you denature the, the albumin of the egg, the white of the, the egg cooks. That's the same thing for your protein. You in, Isn't it there's increased temperature when we're doing activity? Any kind of activity increases the temperature, right? And so, the, and then there's also what you call the fetal hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin also. Fetal hemoglobin also has a higher affinity for oxygen. So, for pregnant women, that's why pregnant women are anemic. Their ox, the air that they breathe in, it's in their RBCs bound to the hemoglobin. But the fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity. So they grab the oxygen from the mother, and as a result, the mother becomes anemic. But those are the factors that promote the release or transfer of oxygen from RBC to your tissue cells. Acid, increased temperature, and fetal hemoglobin if you are pregnant. Now let's look at our carbon dioxide. How is carbon dioxide transported? It, they're both in the blood, right? For oxygen, it's mainly inside your RBC, some of it in the plasma. For carbon dioxide, the main way to transport carbon dioxide is in the plasma. Most of the carbon dioxide is delivered to the lungs in the plasma as bicarb, bicarbonate. See, 70% of it as bicarb. Some may be as plain carbon dioxide. And then there's a little bit bound to hemoglobin also. This is what you call carbaminohemoglobin. You need to know the difference between the, these two, okay? Carbaminohemoglobin, and I know I already discussed this one, and carboxyhemoglobin. This is the carbon monoxide poisoning. This is normal carbon dioxide. This is the poison. Remember, carbon monoxide, that's why it's so poisonous or deadly because this bumps off the oxygen, has a higher affinity to the iron. This is carbamino. It binds to the amino group, not to the iron group. So this is normal CO2. Okay? And then when it gets to the lungs, you just, a higher concentration here, it moves from here to here and then you exhale it. Is it clear so far? Do you have any questions? No questions? Okay. So the main function of your respiratory system is really carried out by your lungs. Air exchange and all of that, it's carried out mainly by your lungs. All these organs, beginning with your nose, your uh, pharynx, your larynx, all of those structures right here, they are, they just serve to connect the atmosphere with your lungs. But everything, air exchange, exchange between carbon dioxide and oxygen, it is carried out by your lungs. That is why it is very important to have healthy lungs. And so what we test is what you call pulmonary function testing. We test the health of your lungs using what you call spirometry. So spirometry measures your lungs only. I remember in the lecture test of the respiratory system, 
there was a picture of the spirogram. And this is already labeled for you. You're going to do spirometry today also. You're going to breathe into a spirometer and measure if you have normal uh, lung volumes or not. There's different measurements for males or females. Okay? So, and don't forget, each and every one, because I remember in the test there were choices. Let, or you're going to write them. It will be labeled like this for you. And then you just, and then another option, and it says that you can also write all or none. That is also an option. Remember that this one, okay, this one measures the lungs only. And so the lungs and the respiratory tract, those are different. Respiratory tract begins from the nose. I remember in the test there was a question. There was one number where it says it measures the air or the pressure in your respiratory tract. Your choice should be none. This one measures only what? Lungs. Nothing else. Just the lungs. Why is it important to measure the lungs? Because that's where air is picked up. That's what we want to make sure. Is that cool the sac? Healthy or not? You may have healthy nose, bronchus, everything. If the cool the sac is compromised, you won't have. You will have a problem with air exchange. That's why lung cancer is deadly. Okay? So, again, in the test, this came out, but it will be labeled for you. So, what you need to know is... What do each of these mean? Okay. So here, volume refers to the amount of air in there. And then if you add any two or three volumes, that gives you your capacity. And you're going to do some spirometry measurements, computations in your worksheet. So normally, this is what you call the tidal volume. This is the normal air you breathe in and out. You don't need to memorize. Well, I guess as, as long as you understand what it is, I think you should be able to answer. It will be labeled for you again. Tidal volume is normal air you breathe in a normal breath. Normal breathing is called eupnea. And then hyperventilation. What does this mean, hyperventilation? You what? Breathe fast or tachypnea. Tachypnea and hyperventilation are the same. Increased breathing rate. Tachycardia, increased heart rate. Tachypnea is increased breathing rate. Bradycardia is low heart rate, right? So bradypnea is decreased breathing rate or hypoventilation. I know you know this apnea. Apnea means? Very good. You don't breathe. How about sleep apnea? Is sleep apnea deadly or not? Yes. It is deadly. Very good. You, you can die from sleep apnea. I think the, the spouse is the one who gets scared, right? We can't sleep. We want to hear them breathe again. So we get tired because we're awake listening to them. Why, why is it the people who have sleep apnea? Why are they tired? Because when there's apnea, there's no oxygen. So there's no oxygen going to your body. When they wake up, they're so tired. And that CPAP machine, even though it's so cumbersome, that's a lifesaver. You should tell them. There is, no, is there any other way you should ask them? Is there any other way for oxygen to get to your body? No other way except to your lungs. So even though that CPAP machine is so, I guess you'll get used to it, right? You just tell them they need that machine. It is their life, okay? So, tidal volume is normal breathing. And when you do your uh, spirometry, you're going to be asked to breathe normally. Please do, 
you want your respiratory, your your diaphragm, and your your ribs to really expand, so you go like this. So that's going to be normal breathing, okay? And you know that there's that reserve. You can inhale even deeper than your normal breath. So it's called inspiratory reserve volume. Make sense? Okay? So if you combine this two, you will have inspiratory capacity. See? <coughs> then you know that you can exhale even stronger. This is your expiratory reserve volume. You com combine the two, you have your expiratory capacity. Then no matter how long you exhale, there will always be air called residual volume. You cannot get rid of that one. That's the air that's left there to prevent your lungs from collapsing. That's why if people drown, or somebody is killed and then they throw them in the water after a few days, the lungs, uh, the body floats. It's the air here that makes them float. That's called the residual. You cannot get rid of this one. Okay. And so all of the air that you breathe in plus all of the air that you breathe out is called the vital capacity. If you consider all of the air in there, it's called your uh, total lung capacity. See, you don't need to memorize any definition. As long as you know tidal volume, you can just tell the story to yourself. Right? You know that you can inhale deeper, exhale deeper. Then you know residual means you, that's the one that stays there. You can answer. Except, don't forget the word respiratory tract versus lung. This only measures lungs, has nothing to do with the air in your respiratory tract. So I want you to know the difference between uh, dead space air. There is dead space air or dead air. The air that is not in your lungs is dead space air. It's not participating in exchange. The air in my nose, there's air there. In my bronchus, there's air. It's just not participating in exchange. So I call it dead space air. And there's two types of dead space air. Anatomical dead space air and physiological dead space air. So anatomical is the anatomy. You cannot change anatomical dead space air. It's your anatomy. You can increase it, you can decrease it. Physiological dead space air is your lungs. Let's say you have pneumonia or maybe atelectasis or any kind of lung problem. Now you increase your dead space. That's your physiological. This one you can change. This one you cannot. It's an anatomy. You understand the difference? Okay. So, now we talk about uh, two types of problems with your lungs, then your respiratory system. One called compliance problems and the other one called restrictive problems. So when you say compliance, refers to the elasticity, how much the lungs will expand. Anything like, em tell me, emphysema must be a compliance problem because it's the lungs. Asthma. With asthma, there's constriction. It is called restrictive problems. You will see that if you decide to work as a respiratory physiologist or in the ER, you will see compliance, restrictive. Now you understand those two terms. Compliance always refers to the lungs. And restrictive will always refer, like, like pneumonia, affects compliance. Restrictive is your tubes, your airways. 
okay? You have any questions? The respiratory system is very, very easy. By the way, there is, I want you to know this one, it's somewhere in the slide, ventilation perfusion coupling. The blood flow to the lungs is not the same as the blood flow to your tissues. So the blood goes to the lungs to pick up oxygen. Does it make sense? If, let's say in the alveolus, there is low oxygen, will, or there is high carbon dioxide, will blood flow there? No, because the, the purpose of the blood flowing there is to pick up oxygen. If there's low oxygen here, or high carbon dioxide, it will be rerouted somewhere else. The opposite is in your tissues, right? In your tissues, if there's high carbon dioxide, blood flows there. It's the opposite here. It's called ventilation perfusion. Any part where, there's, where the ventilation is compromised, there will be no perfusion or decreased perfusion. Okay? So break for five minutes, then we do our... I love